Media Magazine, everybody. I'm Mary Hart, and this is the headquarters of the Completely Elvis Fan Club of Los Angeles. Though it's been over three years since his death, thousands of devoted admirers of Elvis's all over the world keep fan clubs like this one alive. Bruce and Stephanie Maltz run this club, and they have a very successful mail order business. On Saturday nights, this room is literally filled with people who also come to see Elvis movies. Amazingly, it almost seems as though Elvis is bigger in death than he was while he was alive. In fact, so much publicity has been done about Elvis over the years that it would seem impossible to find new facts about him. But tonight, in our first story, we're going to reveal a side of Elvis to you that few people have ever seen in depth, his spiritual search for meaning in life. We'll be talking with a man who was Elvis's metaphysical mentor for over eight years. He was known to the world as the king of rock and roll, and his musical legacy and phenomenal following are unparalleled. There are still thousands of people all over the world who are devoted and active Elvis fan club members. And since his death in August of 1977, at least one book a month has been written about the man Elvis Aaron Presley. One of the most recent and intriguing is this book right here. It's called The Truth About Elvis. And recently I had the opportunity of spending a day with one of its co-authors, a man who for eight years was Elvis his intimate spiritual advisor and hairdresser, Larry Geller. His name was Elvis Aaron Presley, and he became known as the king of rock and roll. He was famous. He was loved the world over. He was a millionaire. And yet one thing eluded the man who had everything, a sense of purpose. Elvis was spiritually lost. In the search for enlightenment, there's an ancient adage, when the pupil is ready, the teacher will arrive. In 1964, Elvis was ready, and the teacher came in the unlikely form of a young hairdresser named Larry Geller. My first meeting with Larry took place at the now desolate Pan Pacific Auditorium, the site of Elvis's very first Los Angeles concert appearance. We drove there in the Lincoln Continental given to Larry by Elvis just a few weeks before his death. Well, Barry, this is where I originally met Elvis back in the early 50s when he first came here. And this was where he came to uh, perform in concert. And uh, I came with my friends. I was 15 years old. And we tried to uh, get inside and we couldn't. And luckily, we met Elvis at the back door. Little knowing that eight years later, you would actually be working for the man. I wouldn't have dreamt that in my wildest dreams. That was too outrageous to even think of. How did it happen? Well, it happened this way. I was cutting hair at Sebring. Uh, I was cutting Johnny Rivers hair. And I got the phone call from Alan Fortas, who was one of Elvis's aides, and invited me up to the house. And I went up to Elvis's house in Bel Air, and I gave him his first haircut. We went into the bathroom, and Elvis was telling me that he's just finishing this movie Roustabout with Barbara Stanwyck. And he showed me how he wanted his hair. So I did his hair, which took about 20 to 30 minutes. And after I cut his hair, Elvis asked me about my background. And I, I told him about my interest in philosophy and parapsychology and religion. And he said, tell me more, tell me more. And then the conversation got deeper, and we started talking about the meaning of life, the purpose of existence. Why are we here? Where are we going? Where do we come from? And the conversation went on for about three or four hours, and I told Elvis there's, a, there's books I could give him. And uh, I told him about a book called The Impersonal Life, which spoke about the inner voice. When I said inner voice, Elvis said, inner voice? What, what, what inner voice? I said, well, I'm going to bring you this book tomorrow, and it will explain it better than I could right now. As I was driving home, I thought to myself, my Lord, I'm going to give him the impersonal life, which is a very deep spiritual book. And this is before the reborn movement, before uh, the Beatles and the gurus, before Scientology, before, before all that business. So what I'm saying is in those years, it was very different and very strange. And I didn't know how Elvis was going to accept all this. Well, I, I knew that I had to give him that book. And and that's exactly what I did because I felt, look, here's a man that's he's an important person, is a beautiful soul, obviously. And the next day, I went to Paramount Studio and I gave Elvis the book in the morning. By that evening, he read the book and I came into the room and he said, Larry, I don't believe that book. This has answered so many things for me. And that's how it all started with Elvis and the books. the Bodhi tree. After that initial meeting with Elvis, Larry Geller spent many hours here searching for various books for Elvis to read. He read books on all major religions. Uh, his favorite book outside of the impersonal life was the Bible. He was uh, a Christian person, I would say. But he found 
truth. He found pearls of wisdom in all major religions of the world, from Buddhism, yoga, Sufism, uh, everything. He didn't stop. He was, a, he was a searcher. And during this time is when Elvis had a tremendous spiritual awakening in the desert. He saw a vision in the clouds, the face of Christ, and that really changed his life. After that, he said, I'm not a believer anymore. I don't have to believe. Now I know, because I was touched. Right after that is when he did his first of his greatest gospel albums, How Great Thou Art. And he, uh, in fact, he won five Grammy Awards for gospel albums. How great thou art. Despite his successful venture into religious music, Elvis remained dissatisfied with his life and embarrassed over his frivolous film career. The long hours he spent reading and meditating with Larry eventually led to resentment and suspicion among the Memphis entourage of friends and traveling companions. Uh, there was tension, and um, it got to a, it, it built up. And behind Elvis's back, the, a few of the guys would call me. Oh, they would say, "Here comes the Swami. Here comes the Mystic." Here comes this, here comes that. So I decided that I'd have to leave because if I stayed, it would not be good. I'd be pushing, I'd be pushing it. It wouldn't be good for me. It wouldn't be good for Elvis. And I knew that if I left, that I would return someday. It's inevitable. The circle would be completed. Larry and Elvis went their separate ways for seven years. Then in 1972, they were happily reunited backstage after one of Elvis's record-breaking Las Vegas engagements. It was an incredible moment. And we went upstairs, and we walked, Elvis and I walked into a suite, and the first thing that I saw were 50 or 60 books on the floor, not new books, all the old books that I gave him, worn and dog-eared and used, used, all on the floor. And in a moment, I realized, oh my god, he did it. He stayed with it, he's his own man, and he, he's, uh, he wasn't influenced, and now he knows. That was a beautiful moment when I saw those books. Do you think Elvis had a premonition of his own death? It's perfectly clear to me that he did, and he even mentioned it to me and a few other people at various times. And I remember one night, um, this is a few months before he died, and he mentioned to Kathy Westmoreland, who uh, sang with Elvis. He said, you know, Kathy, I know what some of the people are thinking, what the fans must think. They see me out there, and they think I'm fat. I'll tell you one thing, I'm going to look good in my coffin. And he did. It's hard to describe, uh, but there was a certain peace, and you could see that it was supposed to be this way. It was destiny. The Elvis memorabilia we just saw came from the archives of the Completely Elvis Fan Club and Ron Fermanek. We would like to thank all of the people involved. Scott will be back in a minute with a look at our PM Magazine departments.